Uh, we are concluding today our series of messages called Full Sand. Full Sand, that thought that you feel, that feeling you feel when you're on the edge of a, a, of a cliff, you're ready to jump into the water and you gotta just make the decision, this is the moment, I'm on my way. That moment, that, that feeling you feel when you're in the starter's box about to run a race and it's on your mark, get set. That anticipatory feeling we're about to go all in. We're about to throw our hearts into something great. In order to really embrace this message, you need to believe that you're sent. Do you know you're sent? Like generally speaking, every person in this room, we have a general call. We are on mission together. God is sending us. I was talking to somebody yesterday, a friend of mine, or Friday I should say. We were talking about the church. And he's like, I wonder what I could share with people that might inspire them about the purpose of the church. And I'm like, man, from, from front of the Bible to the back, there is just everything to say. God is on, on a mission. He calls us the body of Christ. What a great picture. That he's the head and we're the body. And though we are dissimilar, we are not disjointed. We actually get to work together with a unified purpose. And the Bible says that we are held together by a, a, a bond of peace. A unity and a bond of peace, like a ligament that holds us together. What an exciting thought that we're in forward motion, that we're going somewhere. Come on, do you believe you're sent? Uh, before we get into the message, i got to convince you that we are sent. We're really, truly sent. The Bible also describes us this way, that we collectively are the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ, that God is preparing a wedding, that there is a moment of incredible planning where we forever are unified with God in a celebration. He says that eternity begins with a feast. Can I, can I get an amen? amen? A feast, a wedding celebration where, where, where God declares his love for his people and we declare in return, what an exciting thought. We're sent with purpose. The Bible says that we are God's building, that we're the stones collectively, each one of us individually. He's using us and he's building something that will last. A couple of uh, uh, weeks ago, I was in Italy, and I walked through what is the oldest continually functioning university in the world, the University of Bologna, built and established in the year 1088, almost a 1,000 years old. And you walk through the, the halls of, of this building that have, has been there. I walked through the original building, and you're like, there's been some history, like Dante attended this university in the 400th year of its existence. There's been some history. And I was thinking back to the summer where I walked on a pathway with, with my kids, a pathway that I had built with paving stones when I was a teenager. And we were walking on it in the city I grew up in. Oh, come on, the town I grew up in. And, and it was built to last and it was built with purpose. And they're walking on it like, Dad, this is really old. I'm like, you didn't have to hit the really that hard. <laughs> but yeah, like we're, we're, we're the, the stones God is using to build something that will last. You're sent. Not only are we that, Paul, Paul puts it this way. He's like, you, you get it? Like we're God's building. We're God's field. We're God's workers. He's like, like he's ranting a little bit. He's like, we're on a mission, guys. We're sent with purpose. You know, it was Jesus who put it this way. He says that you collectively us, that we're the light of the world. What a thought. He first described himself that way. He says, I am the light of the world. And they were like, yeah, that makes sense. He was probably making an allusion to what were like archaic type of street lamps in the city of Jerusalem, like these tall columns that would have a fire placed on top. And every night someone would scamper up top and build a little fireplace. And so there's like little fireplaces above the city that would have cast a little bit of light. And Jesus is walking through the city. He goes, you know that I'm not just the light of like this circle. I'm the light of the whole world. And his disciples are like, yeah, that resonates. That makes sense because wherever you show up, there's like this clarity that comes. There's this calm that comes. Anyone scared of the dark? Come on, it's just nice to turn on the light. And Jesus is like, oh, I'm the light of the whole world. And then later on he's speaking and he says, and you, you're the light of the world. And someone must have been like, hey, Jesus, I hate to be that guy, but uh, you misspoke. You should just go back and edit that. 
Because the people here are going to think that you said, we're the light of the world. He goes, yeah, I did. Well, no, we can't do what you do. He goes, actually, you can do greater things. Not greater in quality, but greater in quantity because I'm here, but you're going to go everywhere. I'm sending you out into the whole world. You are the light of the world. Do you believe your sin? You need to know that you, come on, do you believe your sin? This is not one-sided today. If you just wanted information, you could go on YouTube. We're here to be transformed. Come on. Do you know your sin? Yeah. God sent us to do something that matters. We're the light of the world. And not only has he sent us corporately, which is an exciting thought in and of itself, but he sent you uniquely with purpose. And he wants you to know what his will is. That's what Paul says to the, to the Colossian church. He says, you got great love. You've got great faith. Essentially, he's just establishing, you're Christians. That's what it is to be a Christian, right? To love the Lord. Like to respond to God's love for us with love in return. It's imperfect, it's flawed. We're, 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 we're still working through things. We're still stumbling through life, but we got love. We're trying our best, God. Our heart's in the right place. Our, our heart is committed. That's what God's looking for. He goes, you got faith. I can see it in your action. You're doing things that, that look like you believe in God. Come on, turn to the person beside you and say, you got some love? Turn to the person on the other side and you say, you got some faith? He goes, and for this reason, I never stop praying that God would fill you with a knowledge of his will for your life. Some of you believe that, that your whole life is just a guessing game. That your whole life, you're just trying your best to, to guess what God might want for you with the thought that maybe one day, because of my faith in Jesus, I will be in eternity with him and I'll enter into heaven and then he's gonna point at me and go, <laughs> you never guessed it. You never guessed it. I kept it from you your whole life. Some of us live that way. Like it's impossible to know what God's will is. He doesn't really want us to know. He's kind of keeping us guessing, keeping us on our toes. No, 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 God wants you to know what you are sent to and know what you are called to. As a church, we're called. As a, a believer, you're called. You need to know that, that you are sent. And so today I wanna tell a story from scripture. And uh, if you're taking notes, the title of the message is Into the Unknown. Into the Unknown. And somebody just felt like singing, Into the Unknown, Into the Unknown, Into the Unknown. It might be unknown to you, but the purpose for God is not unknown to him. Being sent can feel like we're not really sure exactly what it looks like, but to God, there is clarity. And I believe that as we read this story today, you're gonna find yourself more encouraged about the way that he sent you. Believe that might be true? Come on, I'm gonna tell you this story. It's a story that's told in three gospels. Last week, we looked at the only miracle story told in all four gospels. It's a miracle of God multiplying bread to feed 5,000 people. People, it's told in all the gospels because it's a story of camaraderie and co-labor. It's the story of compassion where God uses them to do something incredible. It's not a story about food. It's a story about God positioning leadership in the lives of people who needed a leader. And right on the tail of that story is this next chapter of being sent. It's a story of Jesus walking on the water. Have you ever heard that story? Jesus breaking the law of metaphysics and standing on top of water. He sent his disciples right after this food-related story into a water-related story. Now, Matthew, Mark, and John all saw fit to tell this story. For some reason, Luke's like, ah, we're good. Let's just keep on moving. But they saw fit to tell this story. And so today I want to read all three versions of this story, all three perspectives and we will learn from the nuance in these three perspectives. Let's start in the book of Matthew, if you will. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 22. It says this, Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead, on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land. It was buffeted by the waves because the wind 
was against this. I love this word buffeted. It looks like buffeted. <laughs> it means to be beaten down by repeated blows. They were buffeted by the waves. It's kind of what, what happens when you go to a good buffet. You start with all sorts of energy. You're like, I'm going to take this buffet down. But then repeated blows, one trip after another to that all you can eat. Eventually, you're just beaten down. Anyone ever been there before? They're buffeted by the waves. It's like it just never stops. That's what buffet means. It's just, it's endless. No matter how many waves hit them, there's still another one coming. Has anyone ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like in life, I feel like it just never stops? There's someone here in the room. You're thinking, one of these Mondays, I'm going to fix my week just right. And so I won't be tired in the week. Not happening. You will continue to be buffeted by the waves, likely, of life. He says this, that the wind was against them. They've been sent out by Jesus onto the water, but they experience some difficulty. Some of us assume the moment we experience some difficulty that we must be in the wrong place, that we must be going the wrong direction, that if it was God, it would probably be easy. Well, this story says that's not the case. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them. He was walking on the lake. I love that Matthew just throws that in there. He's walking on the lake. He's not in a boat. He's not levitating. He's actually placing his literal foot on top of water and breaking the laws of science. He's just strolling out to them on the lake. They've been in the waves. They've been in the wind. They've been experiencing a little bit of difficulty getting to where they're going, but Jesus is just walking on the lake. It says this, shortly before uh, he's walking on the lake, when the disciples saw him, verse 26, walking on the lake, they were terrified. Yeah, I would be too. It's, they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. They thought it was more likely that this was paranormal activity than that it was supernatural activity. Like, this doesn't make sense. It's got to be a ghost. That, that makes the most sense right now. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Peter then shouted out, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat. He walked on the water and he came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt and then they climbed into the boat, and immediately the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. What a story. Jesus walking on the water. What a story. Peter getting out on there on that water with him. An incredible story. Now let's look at Mark's version. Mark tells the same story. He tells a few different details that I think make it interesting. Mark chapter 6 you will notice that Mark gets to the point. He tells a faster story than Matthew does. It's kind of his MO. Mark chapter 6, starting at verse 45, says this. Uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 45. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go to the, ahead of him to Bethsaida while he was dismissing the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. After, later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining against the oars because the wind was against them. Just this little nuance, isn't it? They were working hard. They were putting a lot of effort into it. It felt like work. Some of us think that if we're following the will of God, it shouldn't take any of our own work. We should just be able to just cruise. Like, put it on cruise control and we'll get there. No, no, they were working hard. Hard. Why? Because they were sent. They were putting in effort. Why? Because they were sent. They were doing their best to obey God. Some of you feel that way. Some of us feel that way when we're trying our best and we're, we're trying to contend to get through this, this battle where the wind is against us and waves keep buffeting us. I think of people, it's like a wave of insecurity just keeps on hitting the side of your boat and you're like, I'm straining here. I'm trying my best. For some, it's like this wave of Pride just keeps hitting you. You're like, I've been doing this a long time now. When will it get easier? These waves of, of lust keep on smacking against the side of your boat, and you're like, man, I am going as hard as I can. I just can't seem to get to where I'm trying to go. 
waves of comparison or insecurity and you're looking at other people going, it seems like it's easier for them. Why is it so hard for me? I love that while they're stranding, Jesus is watching them. They're in the middle of the lake. It's in the middle of the night, but Jesus can still see them. And he sees them straining against the oars. I love that he doesn't shout out, hey, loser, stop straining. Some of us feel that way. We're like, God must be so disappointed. It's theologically impossible for God to be disappointed in you. Disappointment means that he was expecting this and you're doing this. That would mean he doesn't know what the future holds. He knows exactly what he was getting into when he chose you and I. He knew exactly how hard it would be for us to get there, but he called us anyway. He's not disappointed in you. In fact, you will see Jesus goes and meets them there. Check this out. It says, later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake, and he was about to pass them by. I love this part of the story. They're just working so hard. They're grinding it out. They're like, we will obey Jesus. He told us to go, and I know it's hard, but we're not giving up. There's 12 young guys. Like, they're paired up. They're like, we got this. We're pushing hard. We're fighting these waves. And then there's Jesus just like, sup, dudes? And he's about to walk, them, walk by. I just love the, the imagery. It's so easy for Jesus to get through a, a storm that 12 of them are working hard and Jesus is walking faster than they're going. I don't know if you've ever felt like you're moving really slowly through life. You're normal. You're re moving really slowly. That's just how it is. But Jesus navigates the same things that are near impossible for us, and he's walking as if he's about to pass them by. I don't know if he would have passed them by if they hadn't talked to him. I don't know. But it's an interesting picture nonetheless, isn't it? He's just strolling. He's like, hey, fellas. And they see him, and of course, they're terrified. He's about to pass them by. Verse 49, it says, when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought, he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and they were all terrified. How many people saw him? How many people were terrified? Yeah, it's like a pretty collective experience. When you're working your hardest, getting nowhere, and Jesus just comes strolling on the lake, they all witnessed what was happening. They all felt a certain sort of way, and immediately he spoke to them and said, hey, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. And they were completely amazed, for they had not understood the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Isn't that interesting? They're straining at the oars. The baskets of food that God had multiplied are at their feet. They're straining hard. They've seen that he can break the laws of science for them. They've seen that he's Lord over all, but still in the storm, they're like, I don't know, this is scary. It's dark out here. These waves keep smacking up against the boat. We're working hard, we're getting nowhere, and their hearts are still working through this issue of fear. Now, that's the end of Mark's version. Now, how many people notice this one grand omission? What about the Peter part? Isn't that what the whole story's about? If you've ever heard it told, is that not what the, the focal point of the story is? And then Peter, he did this great thing, full sand. He got out on the water. What a guy. And Mark just omitted that part? Let's look at John's version. Maybe John will be the swing vote. Matthew thought it was the most crucial part, it seems. Mark seemed to, to bring this other nuance. Maybe it's just because he's short-winded and he gets to the point. But let's look at John's version, John chapter 6. John chapter 6, this is the very same story. Food's just been multiplied. Disciples are being sent. When it was evening, John 6:16. 6, uh, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and they set off across the lake of Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough when they had rowed about three or four miles. You will note that John the fisherman understood what a nautical mile was. Like, like Matthew and Mark, like it had been a while. They were about halfway. John's like, no, it was three or four miles. It's hard to tell when it's dark but you can still sort of tell. It was about three or four miles. They're only halfway. They're in the middle of the night, and it's been three or four miles. They saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. When they were willing to take him into the boat, immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. What a beautiful picture is that? 
John's like, hey guys, as the fisherman, the resident nautical captain, it took us all night to get three or four miles. But that moment that we let Jesus in, we got the rest of the way there. Like that happened quick. I don't know if they teleported or, or if, you know, Jesus fired out the outboard engine and got those Evan Roods cooking. But they got there. They made it immediately to the place they were going. For some in the room, I just want to encourage you in this. You've been a Christian for a while. Been like, man, I've been in this thing for like 10 years. I thought I'd be way farther by now. I, I believe Jesus all year. I just thought I'd be farther. I'm still working through some of the same stuff. For some, you're like, man, my, my, my hair's a little whiter than it was. And I still am battling with some of the same things. I'm still working hard to try to obey God. I'd still work. I thought it would be easy if you would be willing to let Jesus in the boat. Just proverbially, let Jesus in the boat to where he is sending you. Bring Jesus on board. Know what happens? You get to the other side. Again, you will note that John does not tell the Peter part. So let's, if we can, make a few conclusions. I want to share with you my conclusions or my thoughts around these stories that I think will help us collectively as people who are sent and individually as people who are sent with a purpose, with a call, with a plan in mind, into the unknown to us, but not to God. Number one, whether or not we are sent can't be measured by our circumstances. Our sentness cannot be measured by our circumstances. It, 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 we, we, we can't look at what seems to be happening around us right now and draw conclusions on whether or not God has sent us here. Now, for these disciples, they all would have known the Old Testament. The Old Testament tells a story of a man named Jonah. Whether or not you've read the Bible, you might have heard of the story of Jonah. It's told as if it's the story of Pinocchio or, or you know, Aladdin. It's, like, it's told as if it's a myth. It's a literal story. A man named Jonah who was sent to a place called Nineveh. God sent him with a purpose. He said, Jonah, I am sending you out into the unknown. Go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, I'm definitely going to go that way. And he got into a boat going in the other direction. His presence in the boat elicited a response from God of a storm. There were waves. There was wind. There was fear. And, and, and so much so that the, the other people in the boat made an observation. They said, there must be a higher power. We don't know what that higher power is. Clearly, that higher power is mad at us because we can tell by the circumstances. So what are we going to do about it? And Jonah said, guys, I'm the problem. There is a higher power. His name's God. I'm disobeying him. Here's my solution. I'm going to get out of the boat. And what happened when he got out of the boat? Well, immediately the storm stopped. The waves stopped, the wind stopped, and the fear ended because he got out of the boat. Now, God, in grace, swallowed up Jonah in the belly of a whale and had to work on his heart until eventually he got him to where he was going. Now, I wonder for those disciples when they were straining at the oars and it was starting to get a little darker and the wind was starting to blow a little more and the waves began to buffet them and that fear was starting to develop inside of them and they were coming to the point of their own weakness. I wonder if one of them is going, hey guys, Jesus did say to go across, right? We are going the right way, right? I wonder if one of them was already starting to wonder if Judas had a little something going on the side. And they're like, Judas, what did you do? I wonder, I wonder if they were starting to point out Thomas, that doubter. You know, I wonder if he doubted and God's judging us. I wonder if they started to compare. I, I only wonder this because they were constantly comparing themselves. But circumstances don't tell us whether or not we're sent. God's voice does. This is a different sort of boat. You see, Jonah was getting in a boat of disobedience. The disciples were getting into a boat of obedience. It's totally different. Someone's got to turn to the person beside you, if you would, and help me out. Say, no, 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 your boat. You got to know what boat you're in. Am I in a boat of obedience? Am I doing what God has called me to do? If I am, bring on the waves. Bring on the wind. Bring on the darkness. I will not question whether I'm sent just because of my circumstances. I'm not going to make this random conclusion that God is trying to passively, aggressively judge me. 
I got to work out my call. That's what the Bible says. It says we need to work out our call even through fear and trembling. Even when our circumstances don't seem to fit. I want to tell you this. Whenever we step out in our calling, whenever we respond in our calling, the waves start coming. The easiest version of this story would be this. Jesus said, get in the boat. Disciples said, don't wanna. They stayed on the shore and they didn't have a storm. They went through a storm because Jesus sent them. And some of us have just made this one faulty conclusion that has set us on a course in the wrong direction because we've assumed if we're following God, everything should get easy. And Jesus actually put it this way. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. You see, the Bible says this, no weapon formed against you will prosper, which implies there are weapons being formed against you. Shots are fired. They just won't destroy you, which would imply there's an enemy of our soul who has always been looking to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus is still working in us to bring us to life that is abundant. Circumstances do not tell us whether or not we're called. For some of the room, just that conclusion changes the course of, of your internal action. Just that simple conclusion. You're like, I need to stop avoiding discomfort. I need to stop running away from discomfort, and I need to stop thinking that God, who is angry, is constantly judging me through storms. They were in a storm because they were sent. Number two, my second conclusion as I read these stories, is that Jesus is always leading us out of fear and into faith. If you're following the call of God, if you're going where he sends you, he is leading you out of fear and into faith. If you think of it, one shoreline is fear and the other shoreline is faith, Jesus is saying, I need you to get in the boat and navigate your way from fear to faith. There's a storm in between fear and faith but you'll get to the other side. As you battle that storm and come to the end of yourself, I'll just walk out and meet you. You need to know it's in no particular order. It was pitch black, there was wind, there was waves, and they were tired. That's the reality. And some of us were like, if God could just keep the lights on and send a, a, a back wind. Has anyone ever been in like a canoe or a kayak or a sailboat when the wind is against you? And you're like, I got this. And then all of a sudden, your strength starts to fade, and you're like, I am, am I on a treadmill here? Like, I'm putting everything I have into this, and I'm not getting there, and you have this little moment of fear. You're like, I guess I'll never see shore again. Have you ever been in the tide? And you're like, I'm good, I'm good, and all of a sudden, you're like, oh, the tide's going out. I need to make a decision quickly because the waves are against me right now. Jesus is always trying to navigate us from fear to faith. This is not a story about Peter's great faith. This is a story about God moving them all from fear to faith. He's trying to get them all from fear to faith. What does he say to them when they're terrified? Do not be afraid. That's the purpose. Jesus doesn't say, guys, because I've called you, you'll never have to face anything that makes you feel fearful. Instead, he's like, go out into the storm. And he waits till it's dark. And while it's dark, and there's wind, and there's waves, and they're tired, it says Jesus is four miles away watching them. He sees them. Right now you might feel like I'm straining against the oars by myself. Don't get out of the boat. Jesus is watching you. And at just the right moment, he'll, he'll come. And if you're willing to overcome fear, let him into the boat. It's gonna help you now. Now, for 11 of these disciples... They made the conclusion, this is Jesus. For one, named Peter, he wasn't quite there yet. He's walking out, it says they all saw him, they were all terrified, and he immediately responded to all of them, it's me, don't be afraid. And of those 12 disciples, one of them named Peter said, if it is you, call me out into the water. I want to experience something that will take my fear away. That was Peter's frame of reference. If I could just have a sign, if I could feel that water on my feet, 
and I could do something miraculous, then I won't feel fearful anymore. I've, I've read extensively on this, and I've heard a bunch of messages about it. This week, I, I read a writer who said this, may we all, in that moment of decision, have the same faith as Peter. The same faith that says, call me out, Lord. You know, I think probably Peter exemplified doubt more than he exemplified faith. The other 11 said, yeah, this isn't a ghost. It's definitely Jesus. And Peter's like, guys, I'm gonna prove it to you. And they're like, we're good. He's like, no, no, I'm doing this for you. And Jesus, I'm doing this for you. Call me out. And Jesus is like, okay, come, I guess. He's like, here we go, guys. Full send. Come on, count me down. Three, two, one. I'm getting out of the boat. And it, like for Peter, he's, he's definitely the main character of his own story. There's like background music and the, 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 the sky's parting and there's this spotlight on him. He's like, I'm doing it. And he did. And he was walking on water. And he got exactly what he thought would help him overcome fear. And guess what happened? He was still scared. He saw the wind. How do you see wind? How do you see something that can't be seen? He saw the wind and that scared him. He was just as fearful on the water as he had been in the boat because experience is not what sets us free from fear. The Bible says truth sets us free from fear. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The perfect love of God casts out fear. It's not experiences. We're looking for signs. We're looking for miracles. God, if you could just make it happen that this sign happens and then that person says this thing at just the right time and then I experience all these things and it will prove to me that I'm really called. 11 of them just trusted. 11 of them are like, yeah, that's Jesus for sure. And Peter's like, call me out, Lord. And he's fearful and in his fear he goes, Jesus! See, the funny thing is this, if their conclusion was it's a ghost, why would a ghost talking to you make it now Jesus? They're like, it's definitely a ghost. He's like, no, it might be Jesus. Call me and then I'll know. And they're like, oh no, we heard his voice, dude. He said, take heart, it's me. We believe him. And Peter's like, I need more proof. For some of us, it's like we need that, we need that proof. And then Jesus, after he's, sinking. He's like, Jesus, save me. And he's like, of course I'm going to save you. That's why I walked out here. I came here to save you. You were in trouble in the boat. Now you're in trouble out of the boat. Of course I'm going to save you. He reaches out and saves them. They get in the boat together. And what does Jesus say to him? You have little faith. I don't know if you've ever felt like Jesus is being just a little bit harsh here. It's like he just had water walking faith. It's pretty good. And then, like, I've heard it spoken this way. You know, he had faith, but it was short term. And he had faith enough to be on top of the water, but then he lost faith and he started sinking. Jesus goes, you had such little faith. Why'd you doubt me? His doubt wasn't in the moment where he began to sink. I believe his doubt was in the moment he had to get out of the boat. He had so much doubt that he needed proof. Esteban, can you help me here for a minute? Come on up here. Come on up here. I think sometimes we, we think of this like, he just did this great act of faith. This, this faith that we're all trying to exemplify. Oh, if we could just be like Peter and water walk. Anyone ever think it would be cool to walk on water? Yeah. And then it's like the only guy who really had faith, 11 faithless dudes in the boat, cowering in fear. Peter has the fearlessness to get up out of the boat. He starts to sing to Jesus like, you have little faith. I don't think it was that at all. I think it's just like, dude, why'd you have such little faith? Come on, man, why'd you doubt me? Of course it's me, you know my voice. Like the, the, the moment where he lost courage was not the moment when he was sinking. It was the moment he's like, I have to do something to prove my faith. And she's like, no, you could just like let me in the boat. That's why I came here. He's like, dude, you don't have to doubt me. And I'm grateful for Peter. Thanks, man. I'm grateful for Peter. Because it's not that Peter's the guy I want to be. It's just the guy I am sometimes. Like, Peter's not the model of faith in this story. He had little faith, but I do too sometimes. Yesterday, I was talking with a friend, and we were by the water, talking about that feeling where you're like, man, I just keep getting beaten by these waves. I'm trying as hard as I can. I'm not getting there. It feels impossible. And I just said to him this, I'm like, have you lost hope? 
Do you still have hope? Like, do you believe that, that Jesus could get you there? Because that's the third conclusion today, is that it takes faith to stay in the boat, and it takes faith to let Jesus into it. Have you lost hope? It's interesting, as we were talking, he, he didn't know what I was about to preach on today, but as we are talking, I was watching a boat go by with this big wake following it, like weighed down, where it's kind of not quite getting to where it's wanting to go. And say, hey, maybe you feel bogged down and you're straining, you're hardly getting anywhere. Just don't, don't lose hope. Because if you let Jesus in the boat, the storm stops and you're accelerated. But so often I've been Peter. I need to do something great for you, God. I gotta prove it. And it makes for a great song. Spirit, lead me where my trust is with. I could just, you could lead me in the boat, though. <laughs> Call me out upon the wall. Or just, like, they were already obeying his call. They were in the boat. They were doing exactly what he told them to do. Get in a boat and go to the other side. They were obeying his call. They were going where God wanted them to go. And they were working out some fears like we all do. And 11 of them were like, we should just let Jesus in. And one of them's like, not yet, not until I prove something. And that's like me sometimes. And it's like you sometimes. But even when we lack faith, Jesus is like, yeah, of course I'll save you. Imagine how different the story is if Jesus is like, no, you got yourself in this mess. You got to swim to shore. Like, it wouldn't fit the narrative at all, but we think God feels that way about us. Every time we stumble, every time we fall, every time we're like, this time, I'm definitely gonna always have integrity until the next time we fall, and then we're like, oh, I'm sinking. God's probably definitely gonna let me drown. No, he won't. He came out, he walked out here. Water's nothing to him. He's over the wind and the waves. Maybe our heart is hard, like the disciples. We haven't figured out that he multiplies bread. We haven't figured out that he's just calling us from strength to strength and glory to glory into a new season and into something new. And there's always another venture and there's always another adventure. But I'm telling you this, they all knew when Jesus got into that boat, they got to the other side. I read a commentarian who said this, maybe Mark and John didn't include the part about Peter because they were sick of Peter, always telling the story about walking on the water. You know what's interesting is history would say that the book of Mark is Peter's version. Like Mark was, or, or Peter's maybe more of like an audio book guy. He's like, why don't I just tell you and you can write it down? So most people would say Mark is Peter's version of the story. And in his own version, he's like, can we not do the water part? I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> that was so silly. I, I had such little faith back then. Back then I needed water walking to prove that God called me. I Man, now I know he called me. I know because there was a time when I denied him and he reinstated me because my heart was in the right place. I used to need God's proof. I don't need that proof anymore. I know his voice. I know what he sounds like. We, we don't need to do the, the water part again. Can we just go to it? Can we just move on to what God is calling us to? Into the unknown. It might seem unknown to God, but it, or to us, but it's not unknown to God. God knows exactly where he's sending us. And the whole purpose in being sent is God setting us free from our fears. He's moving us from fear into faith. Do you believe that today? He's calling us into the unknown, but it's very known to him. I know I've sung lots today, but when I was in church growing up, I was a little kid, and there was this song, with Jesus in my boat, I can smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. You just repeated that a bunch of time with hand motions. But it's true. When Jesus is in the boat of our life, storms don't dictate to us whether or not we're called. And being personally tired or not being able to see the shoreline doesn't mean that Jesus can't see you. And, and, and straining against the oars. I just love this thought. John's like, we, did, we put everything we had into it and we only got halfway there and halfway there was only three miles but as soon as we let Jesus into that equation, man, we were on the other side. Things changed. And I know for many in the room, in a big scale, you've let Jesus into your life. Jesus is the captain of your ship, so to speak, and you're going where he's sending you. But 
But day by day, moment by moment, as you walk through storms, there's still moments where you need to let Jesus into the boat. As you battle fear and anxiety, let Jesus in the boat. As you walk through your own personal battles with pride or insecurity, with lusts, with anger, with bitterness, let Jesus in the boat. As you're trying to figure out forgiveness, like if, if God makes it so I step out on the water and I no longer feel any anger, then I'll forgive. That's not how forgiveness works. You forgive first and then you're set free from the anger. And instead of needing constant proofs, just learn what his voice sounds like. Let's do the things he's called us to. See, being sent is not just thinking of new ways to have grandiose gestures of how much faith we have. It's being faithful. Just stay in the boat he's called you to. If you don't know what God has called you to next, ask yourself this, what did he call me to last? And just keep doing that thing. Just stay in the boat that he's called you to. But I haven't heard from God this week. I haven't heard something new from God this year, this month. Just do the thing he's already called you to. Stay in the boat. And when you see him in the darkness, let him in. And in the midst of your own weakness, fear, or, or, or effort, when you see God appear, just let him in. And you know, what, know how often I see God appear? As often as I open the word? As often as I gather together with other believers and I go, hey, can we pray through this? I got some issues. And whenever I do that, God appears. Jesus appears. It's amazing. You open the Bible and there's Jesus. I'll never forget one, one of my kids years and years ago. They had a little Bible in the back of their car and we're driving. I'm driving the van there in the back. They're like, Dad! Dad! I said, Everything okay? They're like, I just found Jesus in the Bible. Well, yeah, that's what happens when you open the Bible. You open the word of God and there's Jesus. And as often as he convicts, let him in. And as often as he presences himself in your grief and in your mourning and in your struggle and in your difficulty and as you're straining against the oars and you're trying your best, just keep letting him in. Saying, God, I can't do this in my own strength. I need you. And when you do, peace comes, acceleration comes. I want to pray for that for your life today. If you would, across the room, would you bow your heads? I want to pray for peace and acceleration. That God would presence himself in the boat of our life. Don't get out of that boat. Don't try to navigate your way out of storms. Jesus will come meet you right there. He walks on water for you. He's come to set you free. Jesus, I pray in this room, peace and acceleration in Jesus' name. We don't want to be a faithless generation who constantly needs more signs, more miracles, more experiences, as if experiences set us free from fear. It's your presence that sets us free from fear. It's your presence that brings perfect peace. It's the presence of your spirit with us that causes us to smile at the storm. So set us free from the fears that dictate to us whether or not we are sent. We believe we are because you say we are. As you listen to my voice right now, listen, Romans 8, 28. It says, just know this, that in all things, God is working for good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Young woman, you are called according to the purposes of God. He is working even in this storm. Sir, you are called according to the purposes of God. He loves you. He is working even in the midst of this storm. You say, Pastor, it's been all night. Can't see one, one direction from the other. I've been straining. I'm putting everything I can into it. Jesus sees you and he'll walk to you. This storm doesn't intimidate him at all. Your, your lack of, of uh, energy does not determine God's willingness to meet you. He's gonna find you where you are. Jesus, I pray that you'd accelerate us as we let you into the boat of this situation, this present fear, this present issue we're working on. We want to let you in. We will not lose hope. We believe you're working for good. So we invite you into the center of our call. We invite you into the center of where you're sending us right now. We will go where you send us. With eyes closed and heads bowed, maybe there's someone here today. 
you have not let Jesus into the boat of your life. You're still trying to get from where you are to where you believe life is supposed to take you or where you're supposed to arrive. And it's all in your own energy. It's all in your own effort. You feel like, man, I'm working so hard to be a good person. I keep on failing. You need to know this. Jesus will meet you where you are. And the Bible says that, that he will take you from death to life. 